What's up? Welcome to the Tedeschi Trucks Podcast. This is episode number 36, and I am Adam Choi. To follow this show, it's at Tedeschi Trucks Podcast on Instagram, and I am at Adam Choi on Instagram as well if you want to follow me. And that's also my handle on Twitter. And of course, I have no affiliation with the band. This is not an official podcast for TTB or anything. I am just a fan, and if you're listening, I'm guessing there's a good chance that you might be too. So please be sure to subscribe as well and give the show a positive review on iTunes. Doing those things is definitely always helpful for sure. So today's guest is photographer Linda Wolf, creator of the beautiful photography book Tribute, Cocker Power. Over her 50 plus years as an artist, she has moved seamlessly through photojournalism, fine art, street, portrait, and rock and roll photography, perhaps most notably to music fans. She was lucky enough to be on the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour in 1970, shooting photos, then again at the Tedeschi Trucks Band reunion show in 2015 with Mad Dogs. And we cover it all and beyond, as Linda has a countless amount of great anecdotes and stories, including the time she snuck backstage and met Mick Jagger as a young teen. Let's just get started. Here's Linda Wolf. So it's good to see you today, Linda Wolf. Thank you for uh, joining me on the Zoom. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, how are you holding up during this uh, super fun 2020? Um, it's been quite an experience. And I'm, <laughs> I I'm bet. I'm happy that we're moving into a new year with a lot of good things happening. Yeah, it's good to stay positive and and, and keep going. We can dive right into it. We can dive into your into your life and your, your kind of like your musical journey for the most part. Like I was reading kind of what you got into in like high school a little bit. Um, but what about even before that? What are your kind of like even like earliest music memories like from like elementary school age? What what do you remember hearing around the house or or those kinds of things? Uh well, my parents, my parents played a lot of Frank Sinatra and um, jazz, and uh, my dad loved opera. And every Sunday, he would put on the Metropolitan Opera from New York, and we would hear it blasting. My dad had speakers throughout the house and outside, so um, that was something that I, I was. Um, influenced by the passion of, of opera and, and of symphony. They loved classical music. Um, but I listened to AM radio from a really young age. And I would listen to pop stations, for example. Um, especially around the age of 12, I started listening to I, I mean, I started listening to like Peter, Paul, and Mary, and um, Bob Dylan, and well, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, those the Beatles, of course, the Rolling Stones, and then you know, young teen pop music was earlier than that. So, I mean, music's been part of my life. I play piano. My father played piano. I play piano still, and um, I remember going to see. Uh, I think it was the Four Tops um, at a a high school gym, and that b- really blew my mind. Um, I used to love their song "Up on the Roof," and Dick and Dee Dee. I remember really like I was even into Dick and Dee Dee, "The Mountains High," "The Valley's Low," etc. Uh, during the period where pop beads were in style, pop beads are these beads that that girls and mostly girls, I would imagine used to collect and make these long necklaces and round and round and round they'd go. But music has been um, my solace and my escape mechanism for as long as I can remember. I'm just sorry. I didn't listen to my mother and practice the piano more because uh, I ended up um, being close to becoming the keyboard player for the first all girl rock band, but I didn't play well enough. So wow. instead, instead I became the documentary photographer for Fanny and we all lived together. But had I practiced more, I probably would have had a completely different life and we wouldn't be talking about my photography. 
it sounds like you were pretty damn good at piano though. And you got like pretty far with it. When did you kind of like start and you kind of had like formal training lessons and all that kind of stuff? When I was very young, my mother started me, but I mean, uh, I don't think that I was younger than eight. Yeah. Yeah. Probably eight years old. And, um, before the Cocker tour, before the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour, I was actually studying jazz piano. Uh, but it's sad to say, but this is true. Um, I was one of the youngest members of the Cocker tour and I did every drug that was offered to me. And I literally forgot, or I don't know, what I did, but I forgot how to play a lot of piano. Um, really? Yeah. yeah like I had it happened? I, well, I, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I had to relearn a lot of, uh, a lot of what I, I knew. No, I went wild on the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour in ways that I, and not, I'm not exactly sure were the healthiest, but I was probably one of the least experimenting of all of, the people on the tour um, because everybody else was so much older. They had already done a lot of this stuff and were right. doing more of it than I ever did. I gotcha. Wow. Um, what about um, in terms of, uh, did you, did you sing at all growing up? Um, I would sing, but I never sang professionally or never imagined myself to sing. But I mean, I sang, along in the car yeah. to everything. <laughs> you never imagined yourself being like a, a, a the singer type, but the piano thing you did kind of like think about. Um, I, I, yeah. I mean, I never, I grew up at a time when um, mostly in the rock and roll world, my desire was to become somebody's quote unquote old lady somebody's old lady meant their real serious girlfriend. Um, that was the term that was used. And so my thinking was, you know, I would become the girlfriend of somebody in mu in the rock and roll world or the music world. That was, that was probably, you know, the best case scenario. It didn't occur to me until I was older that I needed to, to do something besides be a girlfriend because it was ridiculous to sit around and watch the guys play. And I was gr creating um, in myself a strong feminist. Uh, so um, I was learning a lot. You know, the 1960s was really a, a period of time of, of massive empowerment for, for girls and women where we started to reject, at least in the Western cultural world that I grew up in LA, we completely started to reject um, the cultural prescriptions for, for girls, um, including, you know, we did a lot of bra burning. We, we, we started the, you know, it was like the second wave of the women's movement was really happening when I was just growing up. And my mom was a feminist and my father was an ally. So, and I was their only child. Therefore, my, I was also a son in a lot of ways. Um, so I, and I had been a tomboy, you know, so I really was prime to, to become my own person. Plus my father gave me a camera when I was young and encouraged that. And my mother gave me art lessons when I was young and encouraged that and my mom was a teacher so I got I, I I stopped wanting to just be somebody's girlfriend pretty early on yeah it must have was it and you saw that all around you I'm guessing and in, in, in your in, amongst your peers where you saw females not being empowered not you know looking for more purpose beyond being you know in a relationship or whatever did you, did you see that around you and did it frustrate you? No. I mean, I became, that was where I headed. Um, I was 
pointed in that direction. What frustrated me was the locker room, the continuing locker room toxic male syndrome, which we've uncovered so well in these days, and which I would imagine that you grew up um, being educated out of. Yeah, society has definitely evolved perhaps more slowly than we would we would like, but I think we've made some progress in, in those regards. But I'm also guessing that, the, you know, discovering photography and I guess maybe you're sort of even transitioning from, uh, you know, more serious piano dreams or whatever into photography, that must have been also empowering for you, sort of finding your place. Tell me more about like, when did like photography sort of become serious? Was it like a gradual thing over time? Obviously, the <laughs> the tour was was a significant thing, but leading up to that, what were some of the some of the more uh, big turning points for you in your photography life? Uh, well, I think the reality was that photography became my self expression. I, I was talking to my mother about this the other day. Um, that my mother's a very literary person. She is a she. Her her literary life is where she does her greatest learning. But I'm a visual learner um, more than anything. And so for me, doing photography was successful from the very beginning. Um, I'd say, I'd say I got turned on to the dark room when I was just 18 because um, here's, here's some background in the music scene as well. My boyfriend at the time was Sandy Konikoff. He ended up also on the Cocker tour right. as well. Sandy was, he had worked with Dylan. He'd worked with, uh, um, well, just, He'd worked with the Gentle Soul. That's Jackson I Brown. I think it also mentioned on the uh, online. I was reading. You mean knowing Jackson? Yeah, or did he did he play with him as well? Um, probably. I mean, we were all we were all in L.A. Yeah, <laughs> sort of intermingled because at sixteen is when I met Jackson. Uh, we all hung out at the Gentle Soul house, which was where. Sandy Konikoff lived. It was like a, it was a huge mansion in this, in, uh, across the street from, from the Chateau Marmont up on, on Laurel, up in, um, on, Ch well, on Marmont Lane in Hollywood. And I would go there on the weekends. I was still in high school, but I would drive there on the weekends to see my boyfriend. And that was before Sandy and I were together. My boyfriend Jay lived in the, lived there. And um, so, but that's where I met Sandy. And then uh, later, a couple of years later, Sandy was invited to Paxton Lodge. Oh, that's where he was, was recording with, with Jackson at Paxton Lodge. Uh, he and Ned Doheny, Ralph Kemp, um, Kenny Jenkins. These are all really great musicians and Electra records was sponsoring them up at Paxton lodge. So Sandy invited me to come up there. I know three of us from the Cocker tour. If you, so there was Pamela Poland, Sandy, myself and, um, and Connie DiNardo who took care of the kids on the Cocker tour. We were all on the Cocker tour, tour together and we knew each other from the time I was 16 through 18. So anyway, that's where I saw my, that's where it's getting kind of convoluted, but that's all good. These are all, it's all interesting to hear all this. That, this, this it backstory. was at Paxton Lodge. Paxton Lodge was in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. It was this huge lodge that was set up as a, as a living and recording space for Jackson and for spider John Kerner and Willie Murphy, who are two folk artists. Anyway, that's where Kenny Jenkins had a dark room. And that's the first time I ever went into a dark room and was blown away. And that was, that was the moment at which my dad's cameras, his interest in, in, um, in cinematography, he was a cinematography major at USC. So he was constantly photographing me and giving me cameras and, and recording instruments and things. So it was at Paxton Lodge that 
everything came together for me because all of the, you know, the, the push from my dad at 10 into photography, his being a cinematography major, my mom being an artist, uh, all of my inspiration from the music industry, um, it all conge congealed when I went into the dark room at Paxton Lodge. Kenny Jenkins had a had a had put up a dark room there, and it was it was where my mind was blown. So I would say my true photographer self came out at eighteen. That's awesome. Like not everyone, I guess, ha experiences those feelings. And I've talked to other artists and people in entertainment who have that those moments where it's like, this is what I'm meant to do. This is where I'm meant to be. Like those profound moments, and you. And to recognize them must be like incredible, like that that feeling. Like you, I think you did say mind blowing, or yeah, it was it was mind blowing for me to watch a photograph come up in the soup, in the dark room. And when I saw the photographs, like come just, I mean, the whole experience of being in the dark, and 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 watching a photograph develop. I mean, it just instilled in me such a desire for this magic and to be part of this magic that way. I, I, I knew it was all about light. Light, you know, for, for musicians, it's all about sound. Well, sound and light are these two incredibly sacred, sacred things, you know, in life. And so I became someone who was going to be an artist in light. And that was, that was it for me. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's cool to hear stories like that. I can't help but think about like, because my grandfather was a photographer, not like professionally, but I have his photographs and it's his paintings all over my apartment as does everyone else in my family. And I can't help but think about me and my sister growing up and visiting their house, going from Long Island to Queens. And he had a dark room in there, in their basement. And I were just thinking about putting an image into a, to uh, the fixer or whatever the different solutions are and seeing it, come to just appear it is like it's magical and even if you don't become a photographer like seeing that happen is like profound like in terms of like connecting to a creative thing and also just literally just seeing the magic of the picture appear is is amazing absolutely it, it was only about a year later that i joined fanny as um the documentary photographer and that, and that I started actually, it, it might have not even been a year after that, that I, I took my dad's camera and then I just started photographing. That's when I photographed little George and little feet because all of us were hanging out together. And so we would, um, I just started photographing everything, absolutely everything. I mean, I, I, my camera was with me at all times. Yeah, growing up in LA, it just sounded like you were like around a lot of musicians and and creative types. Did you did you know that was special or unique, or feel, did you feel lucky that you had this opportunity, or was that just kind of like this your reality and you didn't even think twice about it? You're like, this is I where I live and these are my friends. Like, what what? Yeah, well, of, when how you did you feel about all that? Um, it was just happening. I mean, that's the way life felt at that at that stage anyway, is that we were making happenings. We were happening. It was all happening. <laughs> I mean, That's fun. Once, once you start taking it, you know, and I started taking acid at 16 when I was at the gentle soul house. And it just, you know, you start coming to this consciousness that, that it's, that everything is just happening. It's all present time. It's all happening. I mean, and it, we used to call them happenings, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So it was, um, I think everybody, all of us that were part of the scene back then, especially in Hollywood, um, we all knew each other. I mean, that's when I met, met Leon, actually, for the first time, um, was during that phase. He, was, he had just been putting out that phase, I would call between, uh, well, basically the whole 60s, you know, was was ramping up to this. And so I'd say between I was, it was 1968 when I was 18. So 68, 69, I probably met, met Leon for the first time. Gotcha. Why don't you bridge the gap, I guess, from that time period up until the Mad Dogs star and, you know, the Mad Dogs tour and Englishman tour and 
kind of, and we can kind of, I guess, dive into to the book and, and the tour and all that. I'll kind of give you the, the floor. Well, um, Rodney Bingenheimer, who's now pretty well known, was a, a DJ at an underground radio station. Um, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but it's in my book. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, Rodney also hung out on, we all hung out on Hollywood Boulevard. That's where everybody got the acid. So, um, I, and I've been hanging out on Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard, chasing down the Rolling Stones or other groups that I wanted to meet um, or did end up meeting uh, for a long time. And, I, and so I knew about Rodney working there and a girlfriend of mine and I, she, she worked at, a girlfriend of mine worked at um, the Whiskey A Go Go. And she was a secretary to the to the director to or to the owner. I think his name was Mario. At any rate, she and I visited the uh, the radio station, and Leon. I had I had caught a, a, a glimpse of him in his. I think it was a baby blue Cadillac convertible driving down. Sunset or Hollywood Boulevard, handing out his album that he made with Mark Benno. And his album, I didn't get a copy of it that day, but I saw him go by. And then when I was at the record at the uh at the radio station, he showed up to give Rodney a copy of the album. He and Mark came together. And they opened up the album cover which was a double album and it had a woman naked with her legs spread apart on the inside of the album. And so that was one of the first actual meetings I had with Leon. And I thought he was the biggest slime ball, horrible, awful, you know, ranked with, with, with Playboy magazines, Hugh Hefner. I mean, that, that was the old generation to me. That was the generation I was not in. And I didn't like Leon at all. Um, and I never heard the music, actually. I left there thinking, ugh, you know. So, <laughs> um, but then my old boyfriend, Sandy, who didn't drive, called me up at Fanny Hill, which was where I lived with Fanny. They also lived, had a chateau or a, like a, a mansion um, on Chateau Marmont, at the, across from the Chateau Marmont, a little higher up on Marmont Lane, that was um, paid for by Reprise Records because they were going to be the first all girl rock band to be signed to a major label, basically. So they, um, that's where we all lived. At any rate, Sandy called me and asked me if I would drive him over to the AM soundstage. And I'd been hanging out at AM also for a long, long time. I used to be friends with Paul Williams at A&M. We were really close friends and a lot of the other people at A&M because here's this little sort of teeny bopper, which is what I was, that would arrive at, 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 at A&M and, and the guard would just say, oh, okay, come on in. <laughs> Those, of course, teeny boppers were, were welcome almost anywhere. And so that's how I started getting connected with A&M. But anyway, um, Sandy brought, uh, Sandy asked me for a ride. So I brought him over there. He told me that he was, he was, uh, that it was for a rehearsal, the first night of a rehearsal for a Joe Cocker Mad Dogs and Englishman tour. And I actually had gotten in, um, familiar with Joe Cocker because of Michael Vossi. These are all names. If people know these people, they know these are like the underground old folks who used to work in a, the record companies before they expanded into these huge things later on. Um, Michael Vossi was a publicist and I hung out at his house one night and we watched Ed Sullivan where the Ed Sullivan show, which had Joe on. And so that's when I first heard Joe. So now these things are all coming together, you know, all the different pieces and all the people are starting to converge together and I walked into this um, practice uh, at the A&M soundstage with, with Sandy, and I saw Joe and Leon and a bunch of, of singers and um, 
musicians on a riser and a few people were walking around and at Denny Cordell, the producer of Mad Dog Show was there. And at the minute I walked in there, I said to myself, I have to be part of this. I've got to be part of this. So when I was introduced to Denny Cordell, the producer, I said, I want to go. And he said, well, what can you do? And I said, well, I can be the photographer. And he said, well, show me something. And there was some guy I'd never met before, didn't know who he was. He was just standing around. He looked at me and he said, um, I've got a dark room. And I looked over and saw Jim Gordon, who had gone to my high school, a drummer who was drumming with the band. And he had a camera around his neck. So I asked Jim, can I borrow your camera? Took photographs of the rehearsal. The guy took me over to his house. We developed the film. I don't know what time it was when I came back. And I showed Denny Cordell my proof sheets. They probably were still moist. And he looked at the proof sheets and he said, okay, you can go. And so I went home that night or the next morning or whenever. And I told my I probably went to Leon's that night with everybody else. But I did go home eventually and told my parents, I'm going on tour with a rock and roll band. And I moved into Leon Russell's that night while I was probably already there. (laughs) <laughs> that's incredible that's such a like such an incredible story i i feel like i'm like i when people tell me stories like that sometimes not that i hear a lot of stories like that but i can picture it like that's a, that's like a good scene in your biopic and like a movie i could picture that like that like scene of like you don't know what you're getting into and then you're like wow this is amazing and then by the end of it you're like i gotta be part of this and then how do, how do i tell my parents all this how did how did you how did that conversation go down about the tour Uh, my mother was pretty frightened you know she was already worried about me but um i said i'm going to be the photographer and we left six days later so she didn't have much time to think about it right a quick turnaround for that tour with the crazy business situation or whatever yeah that's that's depicted in the book but in terms of the book um cocker power tribute cocker power yeah it's awesome like i love this and thank you so much for for having your publisher send me a copy that's you know really appreciated like this book is just i don't know i feel like i was on the tour like i was telling you before we started recording i feel like i'm gonna dream about these musicians and the music uh probably tonight like just like the it's a great layout the structure obviously the photos are beautiful with and that goes on without without saying um I, I'll just ask you some you know, random questions so we can kind of go through the chronology of the tour or talk about whatever highlights you want. But I noticed that there were like not a lot of page numbers, just sporadic page numbers. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you did on purpose? Because like, I mean, this is just my theory. I'm, I'm curious if this is correct. Like, because it makes it seem like it's almost like more of a memory in a sense without the page numbers as you're penning through it. It's not as important to like have every you know detail in order. It's like you're just thumbing, you know, thumbing through a memory and through history. <laughs> or am I overthinking that? Well, I don't really know because I hadn't thought of that ever. But it's a beautiful thought. I like the thought. The designer of this is Michael Vanderbile, and Michael. Uh, there's a woman named Mimi De Blasio in this book. Mimi and I became friends in Minnesota and Minneapolis during the tour and stayed friends for the rest of our lives. And she's, she's a muse. She was uh, Dave Mason's girlfriend. Um, She has been in the industry as a fashion designer uh, and a photographer. And I mean, she's just, she's brilliant. Uh, She lives in Napa Valley. And Michael Vanderbile is one of the greatest designers in the world and happens to be friends with Mimi. So when I decided, I was offered the opportunity to make this book by a patron of my photography. And when I called her and said, who do you know that I should hire as um, a designer? She said, well, the only one would be Michael Vanderbile. And so she connected me with him and he he agreed to take on the project, loved the project and took on the project at a much lower rate than he normally would. 
Yeah, I'm looking down to my left at the book. That's what I'm looking at periodically. It's a different different pictures. Yeah, I mean, you don't even really think, or at least I didn't think too deeply about like all the structure, the structure of the book too much and all the choices that went into it. Like, you know, what pictures are huge, what pictures are small, how much text, where to put the text, which text to use. Like these are all, you know, editorial decisions and then things that decisions and creative choices that people are making. And they were all um, good ones. Like this is super, super impressive uh, for, for sure. It's funny you talked about uh, that woman, I forget her name, but like with um, oh, Dave Mason's girlfriend, was she one of the, uh, the girls who was kind of around who was carrying a fake camera? I remember reading at no. the show, so, so no one bothers <laughs> them. They look like they're official, even if they're not <laughs> actual yeah. photographers. Let's get clear about that because um, the other photographer on the tour is Andy Na- was Andy Nathanson. She was Andy Cohen at the time. Andy Nathanson is a professional photographer. She right. has her own book out. She's um, she never had a fake camera except for one night. She was holding the fake uh, movie camera, and I caught a photograph of her then, and just wanted to tell the story that. Leon had given out that camera to the girls to pretend and he'd given out fake cameras in order to <laughs> Smart. Like, go around and make us look like we were all famous. But of course, uh, Andy just had that for one split second in her hands. And I told that story, but she, she has fabulous pictures from that tour as well. Yeah. She wasn't that's... on the tour, the entire tour, tour as I was. But uh, because she was doing a movie with um, some pretty outrageous people herself, like I think Graham Parsons and some other folks, she was doing a movie out in the desert. So she came and went, but I stayed on the tour the whole time. Another moment in the book that sort of jumped out at me, I'm not sure why it just sounded profound, because as you're going through the journey, you were going through the journey and the tour kind of with you and through your eyes and like point of view in, in more ways than one. But I remember you talking about like the first time you actually were dancing, you know, oh, you, you know yeah. I think I think on the stage for the first time yeah. that yeah. Must, that must have been a, a sort of a big moment for you, like sort of feeling like you can let loose and you're either accepted or part of things. But uh, tell me more about that moment. Well, yeah, I mean, from the get go, Leon had told me you can dance, Linda, if you want to. You don't have to just take pictures. You can get out on that stage because every one of us, all 45 of us, sometimes 50 of us, sometimes more, um, were on stage with the band. So as a photographer, I was on stage all the time, um, photographing from any place I wanted to photograph. If I wanted to sit down you know, next to Joe and photograph while he's singing, I, I did. Um, there was there were no prohibitions about all of us on stage. We, I mean, when you look at the movie, the original movie, you see um, Miss Emily dancing all over the stage. I, I never, I, I was a little shy, so I didn't sing with the choir, but I could have, I, I did with the Tibdesky Trucks Band sing with the choir uh, for the tribute concert. But so... When Leon had told me that I could dance, you know, I had these memories of Leon as being kind of part of Hugh Hefner's era people. And of course, there were the go-go dancers in those eras, era, in that era, a little older than me. And I always thought the go-go dancers looked completely cheap in their cages. You know, it just wasn't, it was like pre-LSD, it was all alcohol. And um, I thought, dance? I would never do that. I, it's a cheap thing to do if I just would dance, because the first thing I thought of was go-go dancing. But I'd been part of love-ins and be-ins, and I was pretty free dancing in a whole different way. And when I realized that it, pretty soon on in the Cocker Tour, that I could dance my way, I could do anything I wanted to do. I, you know, that was absolutely freeing for me. I let go of a lot of inhibitions and just um, changed dramatically. It was a, it was an apocalyptic moment for me. It, It was a transitional moment for me, probably one of the biggest ones in my life to find that sense of freedom 
and to find it in front of an audience. That was pretty wild. Yeah, it sounds like another one of those profound moments, like being in the dark room for the first time and then being expressing yourself on stage like that with all these like super talented, legendary musicians. I mean, did you know at the time? I mean, it sounds like you did even in the rehearsal that it was something huge and, and something special to be a part of. But what about even on the tour? Did, that, did those feelings even amplify a bit more like, holy shit, this is something that's you know, going to go down in history? Did you have those feelings or, or where were you at? Um, well, Living in the moment. <laughs> you got to remember that nobody was really that famous except for Joe. Joe was the only fam really famous person on that tour at the time. Leon hadn't become famous yet, nor had anyone else. Jim Keltner, he had made a record with, uh, I mean, Leon had, start, had produced records and, and everything, but not famous. So we were just a kind of ragtag group of amazingly, you know, free people expressing the height of the 60s freedom on stage with a dog, three kids on stage too, you know, and all the people on stage. We were a circus, you know, we, we it was, and no, I didn't imagine that it would be 2020 and I would be sitting here talking with you or have done this book. <laughs> no, I never imagined it. I knew I was involved in something absolutely stellar and hot and, and special. I felt it because we were in front of an audience all the time and people were just crazy. They were crazy. They didn't sit very often in some, some, in some cities they sat, but in lots of places they were standing. You know, they were, they were, their mouths were, were drawn. They're, they're, they were blown away by what was happening on the stage. And, and there were times when Leon would ask to have the, the house lights up. So everybody felt part of this whole thing. Leon was brilliant in that way. He knew how to weave everyone together and make it, be something that everyone felt part of and belong belonged like i always felt it didn't matter if it was then it was connie who was taking care of the kids or me or the or the stage um like the roadies or anyone we were all part of this experience we were all making this experience the ladies the girlfriends the kids everybody and you capture everything that you just talked about in in the book and with the photographs. It's like um, you know, it's it's amazing to hear you to hear you describe these these experiences and think about all the images that I looked at over the past few days. And you talk of it being you know a freeing thing for you and so many people involved with the tour. But it's it's even beyond being freeing. I feel like in terms of you capturing just people either dancing or is smoking weed or whatever the case may be like you just capture a whole range of people's emotions and feelings, like all of it, you know, the, the tired, you know, people being tired on the road or the pure joy and, and, or every, and, you know, and everything in between. And that's all captured with, with the, with the photographs. It's like amazing to like, I, I almost want to like go through the, each page and think about like, what is each, you know, photograph conveying something. Cause you feel the, you feel the person's feelings. Like you feel what, you know, what they're feeling, I think a little bit as you, Thank as you, you look at the images. Thank you. Well, that's, what's important to me. That's what I want. I mean, to, to exactly what you said is what I intend in and have intended in, in all my photography career is the yeah. feeling. I mean, that's, you know, it was the 1960s where we were saying feelings matter. <laughs> feelings are important. And, and starting to actually accept um, that we're emotional people and that, that guys could cry and that a woman doesn't need to have a hysterectomy if she's hysterical, which is what happened in the old days. You know, we were blooming and blossoming out of a rigid 1950s. If you look at one of the pictures in the book, uh, it's of an audience at Leon's concert on, in the summer after the tour. We stopped, the tour stopped in May 
And then like June, he did a tour. He did, I mean, he did a, he did a concert at Anaheim stadium with the who, and I'm on stage photographing into the audience. And if you look at that picture, it's in the middle of the book. It's like a double page spread. You see a young woman standing in the, in, in all the people are sitting down on the lawn forever is a huge picture of people sitting on the lawn. And there's one woman that is just standing up and in ecstasy, throwing her arms up in the middle of the, of the picture. And she's blossoming out of another woman underneath her who has kind of a beehive and the look of the 50s. So you're seeing the whole 60s generation blossom out of the head of this 50s person who looks so out of place in this group and was probably having her mind blown. <laughs> that that day. So that's what it was like. It was an explosion of freedom and everybody, I mean, it was a turning point in culture. It was a cultural shift that, that, that created, I mean, that brought us into a whole new place from which we have grown again and your generation and the generation now is just exploding you know again and you capture a lot of that and you know in your in your book as well with giving a lot of the context with the the history and the cultural things that were happening in the 60s like sort of setting up you know (laughs) the story of the tour and where everyone was you know culturally you know so to speak for that yeah, for that time for that time period i'd like to give a shout out to my colleague annie Liebowitz. uh she did an exhibit that i went to as i was right as i was putting the book together where in the front of the exhibit she had a timeline of her life uh, and the photographs she was taking. And I thought, oh, that's it. I need to do a timeline of what was going on, you know, as for me, for Joe Cocker, for the work in the world uh, that I lived in, in, uh, in 1960, 1961, 62, 63, all the way up to 1970 when the tour happened and give information to everyone, a context of what, we were what this tour represents, what it grew out of, what influenced it to to be, to become. And so I start in 1960s when I was 10 years old and I go into like in 61 when John F. Kennedy was elected and the Congress on Racial Equality organized the Freedom Rides and Khrushchev built the Berlin Wall and I buy my first RPM and you know, go through like to 65 and 63, 64, 65, when Congress passed the 65 Voting Rights Act and the U.S. military increased its forces in South Vietnam and the Watts riots erupted. So people can actually get the context of where my life, you know, how I grew through the world affairs, where Leon was, where Joe was, who who I met along the way, like in 66, when I picked up Neil Young hitchhiking, or when I picked up um, Jim Morrison hitchhiking, and he invited me to a recording session when I was 16. You know, so, so these things all are like the threads that wove together to create the Cocker Tour. And all of the explosion that happened in the in the 1960s and 70s, all of these actions, all of these historical experiences, and and that's why I I, I felt so compelled with this book is not just to show a rock and roll tour, but to educate people as to how come this happened, where did this stem from? Yeah, that's that's cool. That's. That's that's a great way of of approaching it for sure. And back to you talking about like the talent of Leon and and you know what a, you know his leadership abilities and all this. I remember this one photo. I, I was looking for the the page, it, but I think it was him. 
either on the bus or train or in a hotel or, or, or plane or hotel or something like that. And I think everyone around him was sleeping and he was like awake and he looked almost like right at the camera. I don't know if you recall, recall that one off the top of your head, but that was just, I really liked that photograph because it almost, it really felt like he was sort of like one step ahead of everyone in a sense. And he was like, are we really doing this? But like, he was almost like having a sense of humor about like how crazy everything was and a little bit of like a wink and a smile almost at you. Not, not a literal wink and a smile, but it was, uh, almost like a quiet moment just between you two in a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he was a Hawkeye um, on stage. He was the, Leon was the conductor. And when you take that word into consideration, conducting, he conducted the energy. Um, he, he conducted the music he con- he conducted basically the feeling of what was happening around the, on stage not joe he didn't conduct joe joe was his own entity and he and joe were the two poles the two forces that came together to make make it all spark so we were in san francisco and i had dropped way too much acid that night and i was on stage photographing. And I was starting to black out. I was starting to fall backwards. And Leon took, we were at the Fillmore West and Leon took one look at me and his eyes just went like beams on into my eyes. And he grabbed me with his eyes and pulled me back up so that I, I woke up, you know, to myself and I could, I remembered the feeling completely that all of a sudden the music just got slower and slower and slower. And I started to, to fall backwards. And then he, he grabbed me with his energy. And then I started like, then the room came back together and the music started to come in and and it started to be at its appropriate rate. And then I was back there again. I'll never forget that. That's wild. I believe that too. I don't, there's things that go on that are beyond like things that we understand that I'm not even going to begin to try to comprehend like on a deeper level where like, that's, that's just crazy. But like, I believe it. That he could do something like that. Believe me (laughs) because I was there. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I feel like we should probably talk about the the reunion tour a little bit too, because I don't want to <laughs> keep you here all night. We got to, we both got to eat dinner at some point. But um, is there anything else about the 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 Mad Dogs and English menu that that you know? There's so many directions we could go and talking about meeting Mick Jagger and Jim Morrison and all these people. I'll have to have you back on at some point to maybe dive down other other uh, tangents and rabbit holes, but uh, what, what, what do you think? Should we move on to Susan and Derek or, or anything else uh, that you'd like to, to cover here? Well, I mean, the meeting of Mick Jagger with Mick Jagger was, <laughs> that was, I think at that, that was probably the experience that allowed me to know that I could probably manifest a lot if I thought about it hard enough and I did all that I needed to do to make things happen. Yeah. Just the fact you ended up in that room is, is is it must be a sign. 14. I was 14 years old or maybe 13. I can't even remember. And I'd won these tickets. You know, he was my idol. I was Mick Jagger all the way. There wasn't an inch of space in my room that wasn't a photograph of the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, but a lot of them were Mick Jagger. So I won this, I won this, these tickets to the Tammy show, the Teenage Music International Awards or something like that at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. And I went with my girlfriend, Trina, my parents dropped me off. They were going out to dinner and they said they'd come back and pick us up late. Um, it was being filmed. So there was, it was a concert with the Beach Boys, Jan and Dean. Actually, um, 
a lot of different acts, Jerry and the Pacemakers, all these English acts. And the Rolling Stones were going to be the final act. Uh, and James Brown was coming on before them, which later I heard Mick did not like at all. He wanted James Brown on after the Rolling Stones, but they were the big thing. Um, so there my girlfriend and I were, and it was my intention to meet Mick Jagger. It was the most important thing in the world to me. So I saw these girls in the audience and they had these badges on that said Tammy on them. So they were Tammy badges. And I said, take my purse, take her purse. We will bring your badges back if you just let me borrow them for a little while. I don't know where I got the thought or even how it manifested, but it was like, it just came out of this intention that I was going to meet Mick Jagger. That's all there is to it. So we put the badges on ourselves and I turned to Trina and I, and I said, as we were walking to the backstage entrance, and at that point there was only one guard, the backstage entrance and all these girls around the guard. And I just said, we had no purses. So that looked good, right? Um, it looked like we just were there. I said, don't just act like you work here. And I said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> and the, the, you know, the ocean parted, the girls parted, and the guy that was the police officer or whatever who was guarding backstage, he took one look at the badges and he t moved aside. And so we just walked backstage. And I remember she went on and my mind was blown, of course. And I stood there backstage at, and I was like, oh my God, please God, please make me meet Mick Jagger. And I heard this guy, I, I heard this laugh behind me. I mean, very close behind me. And I turned around and it was Mick leaning against a wall, not three feet from me. And I turned around and I just was like, oh my God, it's you. It's really you. I mean, just like, you know, a kid would. Yeah. And I fell against his chest. I literally wow. just looked up at him and I was like, oh my God. And then I, I don't know what happened for, I don't know, however long I was there. But then I, I know I said, where's Keith? <laughs> my second, my second best, right? So I, 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 he said, oh, he's in the green room, love, or something like that. And so I went to the green room, and all the Rolling Stones were sitting around on couches, sort of like the one I can see behind you right now, only in, in a square. So there were two more. And they were all sitting there, smoking, talking, drinking, and my friend Trina was sitting with them. So I sat down with them, got all their autographs. Um, you know, I mean, I was 13 or 14 years old. I I was way too young to be somebody they were going to pick up. And I, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> but I was also way too young to do anything more than just be just blown away. And um, then we went, when it was, you know, when we'd had enough, God knows why we had enough, but we had enough at one point and we went back into the audience, got our purses back and sat down. And then I don't know how long it was later, but my dad, right before they were going to go on and play my father i look over and i see him in this aud in the audience at uh, in the aisle and he's saying come on come on you know it's time to go home and, I'm, and i was just almost hysterical i was like no they haven't come on yet yeah <laughs> oh man he was like you're going home so we had to go and i i didn't speak to my father i don't know for how long i was so <laughs> I bet I autographs and I had my moment. And of course I wrote an article after that for teen screen magazine, the night I met the Rolling Stones and uh, told the story. Do you still have those autographs that you got that night? I still have the magazine article, but when I lived in France, I lived in France for five years after the Cocker tour, my mom cleaned my room and she threw them all away. Yeah, my mom threw out my some old magazines, and I got upset about that too. Why are moms always throwing our stuff out? I don't know, but she threw out the Rolling Stones, all of them autographs from 
what, oh, 1963 man. or 64? Oh, man. What about the – yeah, go on. I've forgiven her. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I've forgiven my mom as well. Um, let's talk about the about uh, Susan and Derek and TTB and the Mad Dogs reunion, how you got uh, – connected with that i think uh, someone was just putting out a uh, a search for everyone connected with the with the cocker tour to put things and the you know the mad dogs tour to put things together and they reached out to you how did that all uh, come together well yeah that's an interesting story um so as i said i'm a feminist and i started a nonprofit for teen girls um after my daughters were born and i've done a lot of photography of of women and we're talking this was 1970. So in 1990 or later, uh, I got this idea that maybe a good thing to do would be to interview the women of the Cocker Tour. Because by, na- by now, everybody's famous. You know, everybody is, all those musicians were famous right after the tour. That tour made everybody's, everybody famous. Um, but the women, I, I was a little still upset about how the women just didn't get enough attention. Rita, Claudia, um, Claudia Lanier, Rita Coolidge, and, and how women just get sort of uh, um, ignored and, and underseen for the value of, how, of who we are in these men's lives. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll get in touch with everybody. I'll get in touch. Pamela Poland and I had stayed in touch. Um, Andy Nathanson and I and Mimi and I had stayed in touch. Um, but I got in touch with, I think like in 2000 or maybe, maybe later, I think maybe I put this project on hold and then later I got in touch with some of the women from the tour and I started in doing interviews with them. So I started collecting phone numbers and contacts and, uh, then people also started seeing my work out in public and Rita Coolidge's manager um, got in touch with me probably 2014 uh, because they wanted to use some photos in a book that Rita was doing, an autobiography. Um, And when Derek and after Joe died, when Derek and Susan had gotten the official agreement from Leon that he would be in, he would do this, this, uh, this tribute concert. And then Chris Staten signed on and everybody else. Um, Rita got a Rita's manager, Nellie Nevin got a call from the producer, Dave Fry of uh, of Lock In asking her if she knew a lot of the contacts from the Cocker Tour. And she said, no, I don't, but I think Linda Wolf does. And I I had contacts of a lot of people by this time. So Dave called me and and told me that I was invited with my family, my daughters, to come and take up my role as photographer again for this this uh, concert that was going to be happening. And could I give him the phone numbers and contact information for the people that I knew? And I knew most of it, so I gave him the contact information. Um, I did not know the music of Tedeschi Trucks Band very well. I didn't know who uh, Warren Haynes was of Government Mule and of the Allman Brothers. I didn't know a lot of these musicians, Chris Robinson of Black Crows. This wasn't my style of music in the, you know, 20, in, in, in the two th- in the, in the 21st century. It I was wasn't in, your era. It I wasn't my era. It was, you know, my daughters may have known them, but they may not have even known them very well. And at any rate, I used to hear Tedeschi Trucks Band on the radio, on the blues station. But that's it. So I didn't, I didn't know any of these people when we first arrived at the at the concert. But I did a lot of of looking into who they were before. But it all happened very fast again. I think <laughs> Dave, Dave called me in May, 
and we did the show September 11th, 2015. So it was a very quick uh, turnaround. I was so excited, I decided to make a little memory book that I would um, give away to everybody, to the Tudeski Trucks Band, to my alumni. And uh, so I had made a tiny little paperback memory book for that, that concert. And my girls and I were invited to, um, to set up a booth at, at, the, at the lock-in festival. And I'd, I'd never done any festival boothing or anything like that. My work had completely, tra- you know, I, w- I wasn't involved in rock and roll work at the time. I wasn't going to, to um, concerts and, and doing photography of concerts in, uh, you know, like at, for, t- until 2015, until I went and did the tribute concert. I was doing other kinds of photography. I'd traveled all over the world. I'd gone to China, right. and, you know, Africa and India and done other projects. But, oh, I just... Um, it just was getting more and more exciting. And the, I hired Heather, my daughter, to, to be my assistant, and Talina, my other daughter, to be our driver. And um, my other daughter, Genevieve, she came. So we were like this fabulous little... I, I mean, I, I just had like this entourage of the most beautiful teen, you know, 20-year-old girls they're 20, in their 20s, early 30s, just helping me and we arrived at that tribute concert the day we arrived it must have been 110 degrees as we put up our our booth we were sweating we were so hot we thought we were going to like die of heat prostration that was going to be the first day the first night of of rehearsal we put up that booth um, on the lock-in property. And when we came to the lock-in, um, what's called the carriage house, which, which is where the rehearsals go on for the lock-in show, we were dripping with sweat. So we went into the bathroom there. We took off all our clothes. There was no way I was going to put a bra back on because my bra was sopping wet. So my daughter figured out how to put my dress back on me. We were there for about an hour with my head underneath the water, the cold water trying to cool down. And she, she, she managed to figure out how to make my dress so that my breasts didn't look like, you know, I was back in the sixties braless. (laughs) That'd be appropriate. Yeah, it was actually. So I walked out of that um, bathroom straight into Derek trucks straight into Derek. And I, that was the first meeting we had. Um, and then uh, from there, everybody from Tedeschi Trucks Band came in off the bus through the, through the hallway into the, and, we, and all the alumni, we all, congregated in this rehearsal room and immediately everyone went to their instruments immediately it was like this blind date for a lot of us that was the ice was broken because the music just started being they started playing the music and i just started photographing and it was another happening it was just like back at the Cocker tour. And I remember Rita, when she came in, she was like, oh my God, this is even better than the Cocker tour. Why is that? Well, the music was absolutely extraordinary. Everyone was so high. Everyone wanted to, to make a good impression. The, the young ones wanted to make a good impression on the old ones. The old ones wanted to make a good impression on the young one. And they all wanted everybody to like each other. Everyone wanted to be liked. And then I had all these books that I was handing out that looked like high school annuals. And so everyone was going around having signatures. You know, will you sign my book? Will you sign my book? It became like we were all just young 
and nobody famous and nobody had an ego and and everyone just was their total self what a great vibe oh it and then the rehearsals themselves were just i mean almost they were they were better for me than the performance and the performance was off the charts but the rehearsals were where everyone was just so chill everyone was happy and glorious and outside while all this was going on outside was one of the worst freak storms that blew through that rented the back this enormous backdrop in two of we didn't know any of this was going on by the way it was like it was like another apocalypse the, the trees were uprooted um there was more rain than they, they had to close they had to shut down the producers had to shut down the first day of the of the tr- of the festival because nobody could go into the festival grounds they had to rebuild the lights came down i, I think i heard that that one of the um outhouses had or no one of the tents had flown up into the air and hadn't come down till the next day or something like that the porta potties were tilting over i think you wrote porta parties were tilting over people were holding on to whatever they could hold on to with their dear lives all that was happening outside the rehearsal hall and we were just having the time of our lives and it was fabulous yeah, you're lucky to be there. I want to. I want. I want to be there. I would love that. That's 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 all. That's awesome. And I. It's it's interesting to hear you talk about how everyone wants to impress everyone. The young people want to impress the older people, and vice versa. And you have a, a great. I think I'm assuming it's with a great shot of of Leon talking about you know basically Susan and Derek and and I guess the younger crew about you know he says something like I hope I didn't do too bad. I hope I did okay. And, you know, (laughs) even at that age, he, you know, has the humility and, uh, you know, cares and respect for the other musicians. Absolutely. Both of them, Leon and Derek. Derek told me, I told him, I think this is in the book as well. Leon went back to his car at the end of one of the rehearsals. There were only like three rehearsals, Uh, but they were all all day events. Um, And he went back to his car and he said to his wife, According to his nephew, he said to his wife, they like, I think they like me. I really do. Right. That, yeah, that was the comment. And and then I told Derek that and he said, we were saying the same thing in the bus. I think they like us. I really do. little bromance (laughs) with Leon and Derek. Actually, the bromance was a romance with Susan. It was Leon and Susan. I could see that. (laughs) Leon, Leon wrote songs after that for the, pretty much the next couple of years for Susan. Yeah. And yeah, and, and that's, that's, they have a whole history and you can see, you know, when she plays a song for you and, and, you know, has played it with Kofi and for Kofi that, and thinking about Leon too, I'm sure she's thinking about, that's just, you know, the depth and meaning for, for Leon, you know, and his music and Kofi and all these things coming together. It's just a, it's just yeah. a lot. A lot of emotions must be rushing to, to the forefront of her mind when, uh, when that happens. And also, I think about in the book when um, Leon talks about how he kind of doesn't uh, need to be the band leader this time and is happy mm-hmm. to to pass that on to Derek. And again, I'm thinking about that image you have of Leon on the bus, looking a little bit like, "What the hell am I doing here?" That quiet moment with you, and it's in that. It's like that moment where. You know, I'm connecting to the quote talking about Derek being the leader where it's like Leon's like, you know, hey, you know, it, it was a lot of work. I know it's involved, but this time it's all it's all you kid. It's like I, it's cool how all these photos connect and you capture the spirit of TTB just the way you capture the spirit of of uh, Joe Cocker and the Mad Dogs and the Englishman. It's just it's it's continuous. It's like this through line through the book. There's no like, you know break and and how much emotion is and and uh individuality is is captured 
throughout throughout it there's just so many amazing pictures and stories talking about alicia's family connection to her dad with the mad dogs and englishmen quotes from susan talking about her purpose for how much she loves music and i remember you know warren was talking about how i guess everyone did like a circle and oh, huddled yeah. up before the shows i thought that was interesting and i that's that's something i might think about more doing for certain projects and team building things just so everyone could see each other i could definitely see the importance of that and you know it made me think of sports like a football team how they huddle up before play before the game and sort of everyone sees each other and gets on the same page like there's something about that energy and i think that's that that stood out to me yeah uh that was a really important moment for me i took i took my my empowered moment there before the show. Um, Leon would put us all in a circle sometimes before shows, but he didn't want to do it. And so I said to my daughters, because because the nonprofit I started is called Teen Talking Circles. And so it's all about creating circles. And so I said, I, I, I said to Heather, um, Tawina, uh, I think I should lead a circle before we go on stage. And Heather's like, do it, mom, do it. So I I said, okay, everybody, let's get in a circle. I mean, you know, it takes a lot of guts to be around people who are so empowered that they can play music the way that these folks play music and, and stand up behind their music and sing uh, like that it takes a lot of guts to do that to to be that out there and uh being a photographer i'm always behind the camera you know so i'm not out there like that i'm not a performer like that so it just it was like i didn't know if people were going to like it if people were going to think i was weird and this was uncomfortable for them or whatever but i just said okay everybody let's get together in a circle before we go out there and let's just like hold hands and 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 everybody pass energy to each other close your eyes and feel the spirit starting at your lower chakra come from your lower chakra and i mean i i just went on like a a kind of um automatic pilot you know with with telling saying what everybody should be doing and and i'll never forget tim um, Tim and, and, and Falcon, they were like, I love this. And Derek was like, I love this. And I said, okay, now, you know, just bring all our energy together and now let it out to that audience before we go on stage. And then everybody go out there and just give it away. I couldn't believe that I actually did it and that it was successful, but it, it did. And then when Warren, it's important to say something about Warren too, because when I was researching who people were, you know, going to that concert, um, I wanted to know, well, who's Warren Haynes? So I looked him up and I read some interviews with him and I found out that he was, he'd been brought up with his father, that he hadn't been brought up with a mom. His mom left the family and he knew his mom and was kind of close with her, but she didn't bring him up. And I thought, wow, he would be a perfect interview for teen talking circles because I've interviewed, uh, Noam Chomsky and all kinds of incredible people about their teen years. And I thought, well, maybe Warren Haynes would be somebody that would be an interesting um, interview. And so not only, you know, you can actually look him up. If you look up Teen Talking Circles, Warren Haynes, there's two video interviews that we did with, with Warren about his teen years and how he got into music. Um, and they're really sweet. And so for him to make that comment that goes along with that photo that came from from uh, it's a clip from Jesse Louder from the movie uh, that he gave me to use in the book. Um, you'll see you'll see that what Warren says about that circle, and it made me feel so good. It really did because the last thing I wanted to do was to to I don't know do something foolish to make a fool right. Of myself, you know. No, it takes courage to have courage, especially amongst, even though everyone's nice and down to earth and doesn't have big egos, like, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, courage and guts to to do what you did. And that's, that's cool. That's going to be another um, good scene in your biopic in the, in the movie about, about your life. That'll be a, that'll be a, a, a good scene. Oh my God, a biopic, hey? I think, <laughs> I, 
I think my biopic would be very interesting. My, <laughs> my, my dentist, who's been my dentist for decades, but she was doing my filling the other day. <laughs> she looked down at me with her, you know, and she looked down at me and she goes, Linda, you've had quite a life. Cause I gave her a copy of the book too. So she right. knows what my, it was hilarious to be sort of in a dental chair, having my dentist look at me and say, you've had quite a life. <laughs> For sure. It's, it's a, it's a full life. The hardest part of your, of, of putting together your biopic would be kind of like focusing on it, on, on which, which part of it. Cause it's so many, like we didn't even, we couldn't even, we didn't even, delve into all of your photography besides the, the rock and roll stuff. There's not enough, enough time, but just wanted to comment about a couple of more photos in the book and the TTB part. There's the, the, that photo with Kofi and Derek with their, their eyes both closed, just totally in the moment. That's just, that's everything. That's it's just wonderful. It's just great. Like, I don't know, like that's, it's special. Like that's Thank a special you. picture. Thank you sure. so much. I appreciate that. Well, of all the people in TTB, Kofi was, I was the closest to Kofi for the, for the whole time that we, from the time we, we've met in rehearsal to the time he died. He actually, um, we spoke from the hospital before he had his operation that he did not, um, that he died after that. And we were really dear um, with each other. I loved him dearly and um, was very appreciative of our relationship. It was a relationship where we could talk about everything. He would call me sometimes late at night and I would stay up later at night and we would talk about racism and we would talk about music and we would talk about, love and life and people and family stuff. And so for me, that particular photograph of Derek and Pofi was the night where um, in 2016, my daughters and I went on the road with TTB. So this was a year later. Right. The West coast tour, you went on with them as well. Yeah. And uh, Bobby Tees is so dear, so sweet. He's everybody knows who he is. He there was a stack of speakers on stage, and he let me get up on top of the speaker stack. So I had the music where I took that picture from was up there. I was laying down, so my stomach, my body was laying across the top of this stack of speakers with the pulsating music going through my bones. I mean, it was just amazing that to be in that, that close to the music. And I was directly across from Kofi and we looked at each other across the stage. And I, I just felt so much love and friendship from him and so much pride. Cause he used to say to me things like Linda, you're just, you're the you're not getting nearly the t- attention you should get for your photography and i used to really feel very um grateful that he appreciated my photography the way that he did and so that was when that photograph happened in, in those in that moment in those moments right there and yeah it was, was going to say he's i was going to say he says the right thing but he means it too. Oh yeah, we were very fortunate that he and I had only a friendship. We stayed friends. And you say I say only a friendship, but friendship is extremely important in this in the music industry. Not just to, you know, have a girlfriend boyfriend relationship or any kind of like like, you know, one night stand or something like that or even just being lovers which is really sweet and deep and everything, but just to be a friend with each other fr- was very freeing for both of us. Me being married and, and definitely, you know, monogamous and, and in love with my husband. 
um, but still loving Kofi deeply and dearly as a friend. Um, and I was, I'm very grateful to my husband who understood that there was a, a, a connection, a real deep connection between Kofi and me and trusted the two of us. He was friends with both of us and, and trusted the two of us to have a really true friendship. There were times when I felt like I was in fourth grade with Kofi. You remember being in fourth grade and having a girlfriend that you could just not like, me, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could have you could be friends with someone in fourth grade. It was a beautiful relationship, and I I miss him, and and he's he's an incredible man. Who was an incredible man? Yeah, he, he seemed was, like he had like a great ener- a great energy to him. Like I met him briefly at like some shows and he just would talk to me and asked me, I mentioned this before on the podcast, but like he asked me if I play guitar and I'm, he's asking questions to me. Just like, it's like, what is this guy asking me questions for as a virtuoso musician? I should be the one, you know, I don't know, bothering him or showing interest in him. But he's just like that type of person. And I feel really appreciative and lucky and it's just cool that I've been able to talk to you a little bit more about Kofi and uh, Tom Emmy, who did the documentary that that documentary about Kofi as well. Like just to to be or you know talk to people who've who've been somewhat close to him is is something that I appreciate, and that's that's cool for for me. <laughs> I feel lucky. Oh well, I agree, and I just want to say every single member of Tedeschi Trucks Band is. To me, a beloved, a dear, dear human being. They, these folks are unlike, are unlike almost anyone I've ever known in the music industry. They are soulful, real, deep, rich, authentic people who care. One night on that 2016 West Coast tour, we went out in Canada after the the show to a bar and I remember Susan was in the bar and she spent she must have spent 45 minutes talking about I think um history or maybe it was philosophy with somebody a random person in the bar you know she's just that kind of person she put on no airs and Tim Tim has just been a Tim Lefebvre Lefebvre or Lefebvre, however. Lefebvre, yeah. Lefebvre. I know it's hard to pronounce sometimes for me because I keep seeing the VR and I studied in France. But at any rate, Tim is a beauty. His wife, Rachel's a beauty. Kebby, I adore and cherish. We have conversations still, and I think he's one of the greats. Alicia Shakur, she's, she's teaching my daughter singing lessons. And there you she's go. amazing. She's so beautiful. Um, Mark, Mark, he's the one who who pulled me over and said, yeah, come sing with us, which I'll never forget. To sing in that in that choir was like heaven to me. And that I could pull my daughter Heather up, who's a singer. And she sang too. And they all welcomed me into their their midst to, to sing, which is again another. It's it's a, it's another well to me it's extraordinary to be able to step out of one's role into another role you know that one's not stuck I'm not stuck as a photographer which was the same thing as as on the Cocker tour I wasn't stuck at just being something I could be anything and I'll never forget Mark for that. He he just had that smile that he has, and he just pulled me in with his arms, and then Mike put his arm around me. And JJ and oh, Falcon and God, every one of them, uh, um, Elizabeth. Oh, and Ephraim, he was one of our best friends on that at that concert with my daughters because he has twelve sisters. So he hung out with the girls and me, and it was <laughs> fabulous. You know, That's funny. He, from, he was such a crazy nut. And then I did something so silly on the. Um, well, it's not just it wasn't silly. I just fell so in love with all of them 
from the experience and especially Susan, I told her we're friends for life and Derek too. Oh my God. I mean, he, he became friends with me, my daughters, everybody. And Oh, Doyle, he's still a good friend. Just love Doyle. And, and, um, Warren, what a generous soul. We've done so many things together since then. I visit him every time he's in town, come in and see him. He even let me, well, he, I asked him if I could photograph him and I got to, I got to do something very special with Warren and, and government mule is to sit in the middle of their rehearsal on stage and photograph while they were rehearsing. That was amazing. That was just phenomenal. So every single one of them, I, I just love, but I did this silly thing. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Cause go for it. Because probably by now there aren't that many people listening anymore because this has gone on so long. <laughs> it's a podcast. You can listen in parts. You know, you don't have to listen all in one sitting. That's how I listen to a lot of podcasts. Oh, it's all great, great stuff, great that. content. <laughs> well, at any rate, I don't want to take up too much more of your, your time. But what, what I did was I got stoned and went to a yoga class with my, my daughters. And while I was in the yoga class, at the end of the yoga class, I was doing Shavasana and somebody put one of those silk eye pillows over me. What's Shavasana? Shavasana? Shavasana is where at the end of a yoga class, you just lay on the floor and you're just completely at peace and you don't do anything. Okay. Jiva Asana. You're just uh, like this. That I can do. Yeah, it's really good. It's, about, it's one of the best parts because you, you just get into this like incredible place from the yoga class. Anyway, but I was still a little stoned. And <laughs> I got this idea. It was right before we were going on the 2016 West Coast tour that everybody needed one of these eye pillows. Everybody, what? They had to have an eye pillow. <laughs> oh, okay. They had to have one. So I, I went to my friend who ran the yoga studio and I said, can I buy 12 eye pillows? Actually, could I buy like enough for the road crew as well <laughs> at, a, at like wholesale? And she said, sure. So she sold me while I was stoned all these boxes of eye pillows, which I put in my trunk. And when we met up with the band, I started giving them out. <laughs> And everyone loved them, but I felt like, oh my God, how could I have ever done this? This, this is, is what you do. This is ridiculous. I just wanted to tell them how much I loved them. And I thought, well, these eye pillows would make them happy. I think that's what Mark Rivers was trying to express to you when he invited you on the stage and when the band invited you to be part of their whole their whole show and experience. It's it's an expression of how they feel about you. And especially when you're seeing the the trust and what they think about you, that, you know, that's, they, they all must think very highly of you as well. And I'm sure appreciated the, the gifts. Everyone loves gifts. Well, it was something that I just had to do for them because I couldn't tell them you're, you're great. You are Adam. Uh, you're just, you're fabulous. You, um, give really great compliments and you really dug deep into my work and you really see what I've done. And I appreciate that. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. I was like, is she talking to me right now? Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> and they're like that too. You know, that's why they pull together such a great audience and so many people love them. And it's because they're great. They're great people. For sure. I agree. But I think, I think we should both eat dinner. We've definitely covered covered a lot and covered all and there's definitely more we can cover and maybe again at some point down the line that phil maurice photo you got a picture of the phil maurice in your book i got to send that to my dad because he went to a million shows at that venue when he was growing up so i you definitely got to gotta look get and see who, who shot that one because a couple of pictures in my my book are shot by other people and that had one... you been to the phil maurice or oh, no we, you were not yeah, sure we did yeah yeah film. But at the Fillmore East, um, I did not shoot a picture, a long shot. Um, that picture is by the, the one in the venue outside in the corner. Yeah, that's the one 
um, the woman who shot that picture is Amelie Rothschild. I see. Yeah. yeah, I think she has more of a name, Emily Rothschild. Doesn't she have some Emily A. Rothschild? R. R. Emily Emily R. R. Rothschild. She was the photographer for the Joshua Light Show. The Joshua Light Show back in the 1960s and 70s was that psychedelic light show that happened at uh, concerts. So she was kind enough to allow me to use that photograph. Gotcha. So it's not your photo. I won't send it to my dad then. Forget it. Oh, you can send it to your dad. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, of course. It's, it's a you cool shot, too. You send your dad the whole book. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I was, yeah, I was telling my mom about the book. You and, get, and, get in and, touch with me. We'll make that happen for your dad, Adam. <laughs> What's that? We'll make it happen for your dad. Oh, if the you, book? You, you just give me his address. I'll send him a copy. You are too sweet. Wow. It's the least I can do. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Like I, like I said, like it's been, it's been quite like a week for me, like diving deeper into, to the mad dog. Like I've, I've loved all these songs and known like all, all these songs for a long time, but like really like immersing myself in the images and, and the music the last week has been, it's been good for me. I think it's healing. Mm. It's, it's, it's uh, not healing, but it's, uh, it's medicine. And someone in the book described music as medicine. I don't even remember. I've absorbed a lot. Yeah, I see that. It's amazing. I'm really <laughs> glad you have. And and it's a it's a it's a labor of love. So I'm thrilled. Oh, for sure. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, follow you, uh, find the book, uh, plug anything you want? I'll kind of give you the floor for for those things. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, well, I do have copies of the book. It's being sold by Simon and Schuster. It's distributed by Simon and Schuster. So you can get it on Amazon. But if you want an autographed copy, uh, oh, and you should get it at your local bookstore too. If you really want to support, we need to support our local bookstores through COVID. Um, You can just order it and I'm sure they'll find a way to get it to you. But if you want an autographed copy and uh, I stick um, a special photograph that I print in the book for you, you can get in touch with me at cockerpowerbook.com. Or you can go to my website, lindawolf.net, and get it as well, cockerpowerbook.com. And if you go to cockerpowerbook.com forward slash spectacular, you will see a archived um, live stream with the musicians from both the alumni and TTB who did a live stream about, about the event. Good stuff all around. Where people, where can people uh, find you, follow you, if you want to share any of your stuff? Uh, LindaWolf.net. Um, my Facebook page is Linda Wolf or Linda Wolf Photography. And my, uh, my uh, Instagram is, I think, Mama Linda Wolf. Sounds good. They'll, they'll find you. They'll, <laughs> it's, you're, 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 it's easy to, I think, I think recognize which, is the, which when Linda Wolf is uh, you. But again, I appreciate the time. Let's uh, let's go relax. Let's go eat, and not together, but you know, in our individual <laughs> houses or homes. But yes. uh, we'll uh, we'll talk soon again. Yeah, thank you again, Adam. Oh, you got it. Take care. Have a good night. You too. Bye bye. So there you go. My conversation with Linda Wolf. Wow, what a life she has had and is still having. Linda's dentist was right on the money with those comments. But for real, I again thank Linda for her time and for sharing her stories. It all means a lot to me. Her stories, the photographs, TTB, Joe Cocker, Leon Russell, and of course all the music. But uh, anyway, for now, hope everyone is uh, hanging in there out there during the super fun and wonderful 2020. Please check out Tedeschi Trucks Podcast on Instagram. Uh, that's at Tedeschi Trucks Podcast. And of course, remember to tap subscribe or follow on iTunes, Spotify, or via whichever way you listen to this episode. And again, positive reviews on iTunes are greatly appreciated. And if you give me a positive review, I'll definitely give you a shout out on social media somewhere uh, for sure. And I also have another podcast called People We Love. And what I do with that one is interview people from all walks of life, most often comedians and other artists and creative types about their lives and careers. It's casual conversation, but I also ask everyone to highlight uh, someone or uh, people who inspire them, influence them, 
uh, or supported them. It's a lot of fun. It's called People We Love Podcast. Please be sure to check uh, that out. It's available everywhere. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Adam Choit. And I think that's about uh, all I got for today. And again, uh, thanks for listening to all you guys out there. I appreciate the uh, support. Um, later. Later.